So hi, I'm Lisa Giacomo. Uh, my lab studies our sense of space, which is how you know where you're located in this room right now or where you're located relative to campus, for example. So uh, I run, I like to run, and this is one of my favorite places to run in the Bay Area, the Windy Hill Open Space Preserve. Um, and this is a map of Windy Hill. It has all of the trails and landmarks denoted. Um, but this is my cognitive map of Windy Hill. This is the map that my brain has created through exploration and interaction with this space. And the last few decades have revealed that our brains actually have all of the substrates or components that we need in order to build this type of cognitive map of space. So there are neurons that act as a longitude and latitude coordinate system and tell me where I am in this space, as well as the distance that I've traveled through this space. There are neurons that tell me where boundaries are, which is good for staying on the trail and neurons that tell me where landmarks are, like the location of the parking lot. There are also neurons that tell me the direction that I'm traveling as I move through this space and actually act as a type of neural compass. And there are neurons that tell me how fast, um, or honestly, in my case, is how slow I'm actually moving through this space and act as a type of neural speedometer. Um, now, there are three really fascinating features of this cognitive mapping system. The first is that it's really flexible. When you have created a cognitive map of a space, you can take a novel shortcut through that space and at least have a rough estimate of where you're gonna end up. The second is that it's really adaptive. So you can learn a new feature about this space, like the location of a water source, and I can incorporate that into my cognitive map and use it when I later want to remember the location of that, uh, of that water source. Um, and the third is that this system is actually um, highly evolutionarily conserved. Um, so the same cognitive mapping components have now been discovered in flies, fish, bats, rodents, non-human primates, and humans. And so in my lab, by studying the cognitive mapping system in rodents, we think we can say something important about how this system works in humans. So what does the cognitive mapping system look like in rodents? Um, well, we can take an electrode and we can put it in a brain region called the medial entorhinal cortex, which is shown here in blue. And we can look at the activity of neurons in this brain region as a mouse or a rat explores an environment, in this case, um, a large square box. And one of the cells or one of the neurons that we'll see is called a grid cell. And I'm showing you an example of a grid cell here. What you're looking at is the activity pattern of this cell from a bird's eye view after this mouse has explored this one by one meter box for about 20 minutes, where these blue colors indicate spatial positions in that box where the cell was not active, and the red and yellow colors indicate spatial positions in the box where the cell was highly active. Now, you can maybe see even just by eye that in many ways this pattern is somewhat reminiscent of a longitude and latitude coordinate system, only instead of a square grid covering a map, which is what we're used to looking at, say, in Google Maps, the unit of the grid is actually an equilateral triangle. Now, I am almost certain the mouse does not know how to compute an equilateral triangle, um, but the brain does, and that makes this one of the most fascinating features of the cognitive mapping system. Um, so these grid cells don't exist alone in entorhinal cortex. There are neurons that are only active when the animal's near a boundary or near an object. And these neurons tell us about where landmarks and borders are in our world. There are neurons that are active only when the animal faces a particular direction. In this example here, the northeast direction. And this provides us with a type of neural compass. And there are neurons that increase their activity as an animal runs faster. And this provides us with a type of neural speedometer. Now, the vast majority of studies on this system have been performed in young, healthy animals. But what happens to this system as we age? So this is a question my lab has recently become really interested in. And an MSTP student in my lab, Charlotte Herber, has really focused on the question of what happens to our cognitive mapping system during normal, healthy aging. So to look at this question, we've actually turned to virtual reality. And the reason we've turned to virtual reality is old mice really don't like to explore large square boxes. Um, but they do still, and I don't know why, they do still like running on wheels. 
and they do still really like sugary water. Um, so what we have them do instead is run on a wheel down a long virtual hallway, and at the end of the hallway, they get a drop of a sugar liquid reward. Now, old and, mice, old and young mice can learn this task really well. They'll run down this hallway hundreds of times for sugar reward. Um, and that's indicated by the fact that all these dots fall below the dotted line, the black dotted line here. Um, but what happens to their cognitive mapping system? Um, we've recorded from tens of thousands of neurons in entorhinal cortex in young and aged animals. But I'm just going to show you a couple examples of neurons just to highlight um, what we're seeing. So on the left are two example grid cells from our young animals, and on the right are two example grid cells from our aged animals. Now in the young animals, what I've done is plotted the location of the animal along this hallway on the x-axis, and the activity of this neuron is plotted on the y-axis across about 200 traversals down this long hallway. Now, the fact that you see these kind of long vertical bands indicate that these two neurons are active at the same spatial position along that hallway every time the animal walks down the hallway. For example, if you look at the second neuron, it's active when the animal's at zero centimeters, around 150 centimeters, 200 centimeters, and 400 centimeters. It always is active there every time the animal walks down the hallway. In our aged animals, however, if you look at these two example grid cells, even though you still see some reminiscent uh, vertical banding here, you can see that the pattern is sort of drifting around and there's a lot of extra noise in the background. And unfortunately, this is pretty typical of what we see in our aged animals. Our cognitive mapping system as we age becomes less stable and it becomes much more prone to noise. So what can we do about it? Well, recently in my lab, we've become interested in a thread um, investigating whether or not a gene called HCN can tune up our grid cell system. So in previous work in my lab, again, this is in young, healthy animals, we discovered that if you knock out the gene HCN1, you degrade the grid map spatial resolution. And what that means is that the distance, the physical distance at which grid cells are active increases. Intuitively, you can sort of think about this as deleting some of the longitude and latitude lines on your coordinate system. Now, this degradation of the coordinate system by the loss of HCN1 results in a very specific behavioral deficit. So we can ask mice to do a task that's very similar to asking you to remember where you parked your car in the parking lot <laughs> across different days, okay? So on Monday, you park your car here. On Tuesday, you park your car here. Wednesday, you park your car here. Okay, you're always in the same parking lot, but on any given day, you have to remember where you parked your car that day. So we can have an equivalent task in the mice where we ask them to find a hidden platform in a pool of water, but that platform location changes across days. Now, this is actually a really hard task for mice to learn, um, but wild type control mice will learn this task eventually. And if you give them four trials, four chances to go back to that platform, they'll take faster and more efficient routes, which indicates they've learned the location of that platform. But if you knock out HCN1, the, the mice just can't learn this task. And this is really similar to what we see um, in terms of behavior in our aged animals. Okay, so, um, so where, where are we at this point? Um, I think we can all appreciate that determining and maintaining routes through space is really critical for mobility, quality of life, and maintaining independence as we age. And I've told you today that the neural systems supporting navigation are really well characterized at young baselines. And I didn't have time to discuss it today, but I think it's worth noting that loss of orientation often manifests in early, uh, in early Alzheimer's as well as age-driven mild cognitive impairment. And Alzheimer's patients may also show reduced HCN1 expression. So in my lab, two questions that we're really actively pursuing right now is how entorhinal cortex contributes to spatial memory decline with age and how are HCN channels potentially involved in this decline? Um, and while I don't have sort of a final answer on these questions for you today, I think in the next few years, by understanding how our cognitive mapping system is impaired during normal healthy aging, we'll have a really wonderful platform by which we can look at genes of interest or interventions like exercise and how they might impact our cognitive mapping system as we age. So thank you very much.